Um, I am Melissa Weber Mayer, the Early Literacy Administrator for the Ohio Department of Education. And I appreciate all of you being here today. It's, it's so exciting. And just like Stephanie said, you know, regardless of this Driving Readers grant, um, it's just exciting to get folks together in the same place to talk about language and literacy development, birth through grade 12. Oftentimes, we're broken apart for these types of things. Um, and then think about what that means for our state. When I think about why I'm here and why it matters, um, I think about learners vary. And Dr. T Shanahan talked about learners vary, right? <coughs> And um, I think about the experiences I've had with learners and that I continue to have with learners, whether they're young or whether they're adult learners. And so learners vary when we think about where we've taught. Um, I've taught in three different states across, across the United States. In each one of those states, in Illinois and in Ohio and in New Jersey, my learners were different. Whether they were first graders or fifth graders, whether it was a special education inclusion classroom, they were different. And in each one of those places, as the teacher, Right? I had to think about how am I going to, how am I going to address all the different variations of learners that were in these classrooms, including English learners. Another thing I think about are these ladies. Can you guys see these little ladies? There are five of them. They're not all mine. Three of them are mine. The three big girls are mine, and the two little ones are my nieces. And within my own personal experience of working with my children and my nieces, their learning varies. Their literacy learning varies. And so Tim talked about the reading wars. I have a learner, the big girl on, the, on this side. She's in college now. And she had uh, a comprehension deficit. So when she was growing up and learning in schools, the schools hit hard the phonics with her. Right? She can decode any word you put in front of her. But after she read a paragraph or something and we asked her questions, she couldn't quite answer those questions. My little niece, the one that's sitting next to her, She's the opposite. She has the phonological deficit. So her oral language comprehension is beautiful. She can understand things. She can retell stories back to you. However, her phonological processing is missing. So there's that. When, we, when uh, Tim talks about the reading wars, and I think about you know, when the conversations I have with folks about this program or that program or this approach or that approach, I say, well, it depends, right? The best the answer to every question is it depends. It depends on your learners because I have them in fi my family, and the two blondes there kind of in the front, they, they can learn how to read no matter what. Whatever you do to them, they, they would learn how to read. It just clicks with them. And then the, the other little one on this end is my youngest, and she, she has the comprehension issues a little bit. She's in eighth grade. So when I think about early literacy and I think about the, the skills, it's not just for our little learners. It's for our, our big learners, too, and middle, middle learners. Um, and then I think about these folks down here. Can you see them? Those are future teachers. Those are pre-service teachers at Ohio State University. So those are our undergrads. Those are the future people that you're going to hire. And I think about them. And what do they know about teaching reading? Most of them know how they were taught, right? And that's what they think about. And that's how, what's, what they rely on. And when we talk about how complex teaching reading is, it really is rocket science. I think Louisa Moat says that then we need to think about how are we preparing those future teachers. And then I think about all of you that are working so hard out there in the field to meet the needs of all of your learners. And each year, they look different. And what are we doing as a state and as a region to help support that? Um, and then I shared with you this morning the, um, the story that uh, Jathan told me. And when he told me how to pronounce his name, he said it's like Nathan only with a J little literacy lesson he gave me right there so I'd know how to pronounce his name. The other day I got a phone call from a healthcare worker that said, Melissa, I have a 53-year-old patient who wants to learn how to read. She never learned how to read. What can you do? So all of these things when I think about why do I care and why does it matter, the, the, yes, the money is nice, but the money is still, $35 million sounds like a lot. It, it's once we start divvying it up in the X amount of ways across 15%, 40%, 20%, 20%. It starts to go down. So, but the important factor is that you're all here to learn about the state plan, to learn about what collectively as a state can we do so that the numbers that Tim showed, those non-proficient readers, that, what color was it? Do you remember what color it was? No. Orange, orange or green, one of them. The top line gets smaller and the bottom line gets larger. All right, so Ohio's plan to raise literacy achievement document is up. And it is actually organized much like a reading achievement plan. How many of you have viewed the reading achievement plan document? Yes, I see some hands. Great. 
So the comprehensive state plan is organized into eight sections as well. They, most of them match up, although our plan has a theory of action in there and the, the reading achievement plan it doesn't have that section in there. So we're gonna, I'm gonna walk you through that. Today's presentation, we're gonna give an overview of the plan to raise literacy achievement. I'm gonna focus on session, section one, which is the theory of action, and section four, which is Ohio's literacy vision. So when you apply for the Striving Readers Grant, you'll submit two documents. One will be the application for the grant, the application for the money. The second document will be your local literacy plan. Your local literacy plan is your evidence-based plan based on your data that says here are the things that we're going to do. And those templates are also up on the website, newly up there. So there's a local literacy plan, um, one for districts and one for consortium. Where to find the plan? Just go on ODE's website, search literacy, it should come up. Uh, Stephanie said it was on the Striving Readers page. I'm not sure it's there yet, it's on the literacy page. If you can't find it, you can email me. I can direct you to where, where it is. The purpose of the plan, and I'm gonna give you the, the, the nutshell, because I know you're all gonna go home and read the 50 pages, right? It's gonna serve three major purposes. And the first is that it's gonna be a guide to promote this evidence-based language and literacy practices birth to grade 12. In Ohio, the department is putting together resources in order to help you do this. So how can a district, um, you know, be smarter than curriculum that's out there. Be smarter than the research that you read. So how is it that we can identify the evidence-based practice? What I want to keep saying over and over again is though, whatever you're going to select for that local literacy plan should be matched up to what your data is telling you your learners need. And that's what we'll be looking for. Purpose two is support alignment of literacy efforts across the educational cascade. When I say cascade, what do you think about? Just that word cascade. Waterfall. What else? What's that? Dishwashing soap. Oh, dishwashing soap. Okay, cascade the dishwashing soap. Good. What else? Anything else back here? Cascade, a waterfall, dish soap. So what's an educational cascade? Dish soap for teachers? Falls over a lot of areas. That's exactly it. And so here we have local, state, local, and regional. But when we think of the educational cascade, when I think about it, and I'll show you a visual later, I think about the community that we live in, right? The families that live in that community, the classrooms that are serving these children, or the programs, or the child care provider programs, um, the building that the classrooms are housed in, the district that the buildings are housed in the region that it's all housed in, and the state. So when we think about supporting alignment across the edu educational cascade, what we tend to find, and, and what I've experienced in the other states where I've taught, is that we focus on teachers, right? We give teachers more PD, we give teachers the curriculum, but we don't necessarily support the structures that support the teachers, right? What professional development are the principals getting? What professional development are the leaders in the district getting? What professional de development are the administrators of our early child care providers getting so that they can support the implementation of evidence-based practices? And goal, the, purpose, the third purpose is to use literacy acquisition and achievement as the lever for school improvement. Okay, so when we think about how are we acquiring that literacy and how are we achieving as we're moving across. So we hope to utilize this plan to help focus the literacy efforts across the state and ground school improvement. So even though there's striving readers and there's a local literacy plan, that should be part of the overall plan, your overall school improvement plan, right? You probably already have a goal in there around literacy. The local literacy plan is gonna help you outline that plan in just a little more, actually a lot more detail. So the first part of the, uh, the plan is the Ohio State's literacy team. The first part of local literacy that you'll plan, that's your section one, ours is pulled out into an appendices. And that team for the state was experts in language and literacy content, instruction, intervention, assessment, professional learning, and policy. So we tried to cover everybody. And when you, you, know, you guys know, when you get 30 to 50 people in the room with this type of experience, it's, it's a little, sometimes it's hard to rein everybody in to think about it. And we had this across 
grades, uh, uh, birth through grade 12. And we tried not to break them apart. We tried to keep everybody together. Because our little people are going to become bigger people, and our pe pe bigger people need to know what, remember what happened to them, all right, or with them. And this group is going to meet annually to review and revise the state plan. Um, each year, we're going to look at that and review that. The team's going to come together, and it'll be revised based on what we learn. And a lot of what we learn will be the state data that we have and whatever we learn from the striving readers uh, subgrantees. All right, section one is Ohio's theory of action. Oftentimes, our theories are what drive why and how we do things, right? So our theory of action is focused on birth through grade 12 language and literacy development. We, it was first developed in 2015 for the state systemic improvement plan. So I know I have, I see some districts in here that are part of our early literacy pilot. And uh, there are, there's one district within each of our SST regions right now that's part of that. But our theory focuses the state strategy for literacy improvement. And, and there are five components. The five are um, shared leadership, multi-tiered systems of support, building teachers' capacity, building family engagement, and I think that's where we have a lot to learn from our early childhood communities. How do, how do we truly build family engagement outside of our literacy nights that we have? But how do we truly engage families in their learners' literacy learning? And then community collaboration. So section two of the plan uh, is how we are aligning these improvement efforts. This section basically says all of the things we've been doing for the past 10 years and how we're trying to align all of those things. So it's a portfolio of the state's literacy improvement efforts. It provides information on Ohio's literacy efforts and a link to each one of those things. So you'll see third grade reading guarantee in there. You'll see the regional support systems in there. You'll see the state systemic improvement plan focused on early literacy. And then it includes information on the state's early literacy pilot, as I just mentioned. Section three is the comprehensive needs, assess needs assessment section. And so when you read this section, it's in two parts. The first is about Ohio's data. What does our data look like? And Tim gave a little, uh, an overview of one slide. The second sec section gets into a root cause analysis that was done prior to the state systemic improvement plan. So the first section tells us, here's what our data looks like. The section was an analysis that we did that said, why does our data look like that? What, are, what do districts think? And then uh, we use both of those to drive Ohio's vision and plan. So let me share with you what was key. 37.7% of entering kindergarten students, so that's over 73,000 kindergarten students, are not on track for reading proficiently by third grade. Why? There could be lots of reasons, right? We don't know where they, where they, where they came from, what preschool they came from, if they went to a a preschool, if they stayed at home, if they're a home care provider, so we have all those variables. But 73,000 kindergartners. And so now I think about, okay, I'm a kindergarten teacher, or I have five kindergarten teachers in my building. How am I, as leadership, supporting those kindergarten teachers knowing this type, these types of numbers? Secondly, 28.3% of Ohio's K-2 students are not on track to read proficiently by the end of third grade. And for certain subgroups of students, that rate is almost 60% not on track. And then we have 54% of graduating seniors taking our ACT. This is, this is where it, it starts to hurt my heart, too, because the, these are seniors, right? So they're 17, 18, 19 years old. Do not meet college readiness benchmark for reading, for the reading pieces. And it could be 54%. So think about my, my big girl, Arabella, right? She had, she could decode, when you think about how many, I don't know, it's been a long time since I've taken the ACT, but it's not fun, right? None of those things are fun. But it gives you vocabulary words, right? GREs maybe give you vocabulary words. It gives you sections to answer and read comprehension. It gives you writing sections. If you can decode words, that's great, right? She can decode words. Remember, she's strong phonological processing, but she doesn't necessarily know the meaning of those words after she decodes them. So when she gets to answering comprehension questions, this is, where it, this is where we see it, right? Think about texts after third grade. What happens to them? The texts that our children are reading. 
vocabulary becomes more complex, where do the pictures go? Not as many pictures. So all those strategies that we've taught them, use the pictures to help you figure out that word, all these other strategies, they, unless we've taught them other strategies, they've lost that. And that's where we start to hear kids say, I thought I knew how to read until after third grade, then it became hard. When we think about the root cause analysis, so this is why we said, okay, well, let's figure out why do we have these numbers. This, there was a stakeholder team, and they identified five key areas of, as constituting the primary root causes of literacy underperformance. And they said, one, learners who start behind stay behind. And you, you, you might see this. This all might sound familiar. Some districts are challenged in providing effective support to teachers to support literacy instruction. So that goes back to where I talked about the educational cascade. So when you think about writing your local literacy plan, think about how am I including that cascade? How am I including all levels? Am I, am I, when I write this plan, when I ask for this money, am I, is there an activity in there that supports my administrators who can support the teachers with the implementation? Third, some districts were either not utilizing effective instructional practices or not implementing them with fidelity. Tim talked about that too, right? We have this program, we're trying to implement it with fidelity. Third, the culture of the district or, and or building often was not conducive to effective improvements. So what type of system do you have in place? Think about your Ohio improvement process or similar processes in place. Is the system in place in order to support an effective change? And that families were not being appropriately leveraged as partners in literacy improvement. And I, I've read research article after research article, and I still can't figure out what is the best way to uh, engage families with, with students learning. So if you guys have ideas, please, please let me know, because that is one thing that we are trying to build at the state, too, as far as supporting. Section four, Ohio's literacy vision. So our vision is to use literacy as a lever for school improvement, birth through 12. Um, it is a direct response to the needs assessment. So our vision is a direct response for, of what I just shared with you. And then it outlines Ohio's commitments. What are we committed as the department to do and help support? Section five, objectives and strategies, you'll see in there. And here we have, um, and th this section you might like, it's, it's bulleted out quite nicely. <laughs> so it's and underlined and you can skim this section really easily. Um, support data-driven decision making and planning. Uh, another, and ensure that our LEAs develop evidence-based language and literacy practices. And how do we do that? And how do we identify that? And even Tim said, you know, at the end, but, you know, is this the end-all, be-all? Maybe not. And provide financial support to literacy improvement efforts and help identify sustainable practices. Six is how we're going to measure success. So your sections of your local literacy plan will look like this and go in this order. Measuring Ohio's success, success of the plan, measuring success of the S circle, there you go, striving readers comprehensive literacy grant. So if you hear somebody say circle these next two days, that's what they're talking about, the striving readers grant. And then seven, the monitoring progress, monitoring state level activity. So how, how are we doing? And we're gonna ask you, how are we doing as the state? How is the region doing as far as supporting you? I know some of these, I get calls, I know sometimes we're doing, really well, and sometimes we could do better. Monitoring regional literacy activities will be another one, and then monitoring local literacy activities. So upon award, you'll be asked to do some of these things, so, and there'll be surveys. And our, our state support regions and our ESCs will ask them to, to fill out some surveys and things for us, and then at the state level, we'll, we will do the same. Section eight is the implementing evidence-based practices. And I'll tell you, Last year, out of the reading achievements, last year we had, I think, about 70 reading achievement plans that were required by law to be submitted. This section uh, is where people t struggled the most because Section 8A was about what evidence-based strategies are you selecting to use. And oftentimes, we, people put programs in there, right, or didn't think about what is the evidence behind that. Within the Striving Readers Local Literacy Plan, this section, you will put in your evidence-based strategies that you've, that you've selected based on what your data told you, right? So if your data tells you 60% of my second graders are low in phonological processing, then in your strategies, we should see something about phonological processing, right? Because it's not, it's not being addressed there. 
Um, and, and you'll be asked to identify what level of tier that that is. And so you'll learn that this tier um, evidence base, so one, two, three, four, as, I, as defined by ESSA. You'll learn that if, um, make sure you send somebody to that session tomorrow or today. Um, so th we are developing an evidence-based clearinghouses and resources to help you. The second part, so there's section 8A, there's section 8B now, is thinking about ensuring effectiveness and improving upon strategies. So and that is now, well, how are you going to know? If you selected the strategy and you're going to ask teachers to implement it, how are you going to know, how are we going to know that teachers are implementing those strategies? How are we going to know they're doing with fidelity? How are we going to know that it works? So that section, think about um, what might take place in there. Um, and then there is, a, there is a third part here that is addressing professional development. What professional development are you selecting so to support that evidence-based strategy, right? How will you know that the professional development is going to work? We love to do professional development. We love to send people to professional development. I love to go to professional development. But how do I know that what I'm learning there is making a difference in what I'm doing or what I'm expected to do? All right, so here's Ohio's theory of action. So here are those five components that I told you about in a nice graphic. There's our building shared leadership, multi-tiered systems of support, teacher capacity, family partnerships, and community collaboration. These are all things, too, that we should see in the local literacy plan. So what does shared leadership mean? So leadership occurs at all levels, right? We have teachers. I'm sure you can think of right now teachers in your building who are a lead teacher at X grade, right? All the, everybody else goes to them to ask them questions. You go to them to ask questions about reading, right? How many of you in here are reading experts? I would say you're a reading expert, OK? Because we have some, right? Be proud. Raise your hand nice and high, OK? How many of you know a little bit about reading? How many of you are a math person, but you need to know about reading? Yeah, we have, a, we, have, we have those, right? But when we think about math, math has its own language. Math has its own vocabulary, right? So even though, and I love when I talk to middle school, high school teachers, and, and they tell me what they teach, and they say, I teach math. I teach social. I say, no, you teach children. You just happen to have math as your content area that you're teaching for these children. So how do you teach vocabulary? How do you teach comprehension in math? Those types of things. Uh, Multi-tiered systems of support. This is where we think about those data-driven decision making. So how are we using our data to drive our decision making? Do we have a decision making process in place? Is one person making de the decision for all of us, or do we have a, a group that are helping to make decisions? Are the right people making the decisions? If I have low phonological processing, I better have one of my reading experts helping to make that decision, right? If I have a high percentage of English learners, I better have my English learner teacher helping to make those decisions. And then thinking about differentiation and what does that, what does that look like? All right. Teacher capacity. This is where I think we're, we're pretty good at, right? We're good at, at building our capacity of our teachers with, with professional development. We send them here, we send them there. They have to get their license renewed. We have to have our credits. What I think about is, is when we think about teacher capacity, is it sustainable? So yes, there's some money attached to uh, the Striving Readers Grant. But when that money goes away, how are you going to be able to sustain these new ideas, these new evidence-based practices, these new strategies that you're putting into place. So we need to think about that. And then think about professional development as being embedded professional learning. If I'm a principal and I'm doing a walkthrough, do I know what I'm looking for? Do I even know what phonological processing is? When I say that, does, how many people go, I don't even know what she's talking about? Right? Yeah. And there was a time when I didn't know what that was either. Evidence-based language and literacy practices and interventions, data decision, data-driven decision making here. What's that called? Oh, good, alliteration. See? <laughs> it wasn't as hard. You thought I was trying to trick you. And then think about coaching. Not coaching just for teachers, but are we coaching our system principals? Are we coaching our intervention specialists? Are we coaching our principals? Are there systems in place so that we can all understand it? We all do not need to be experts in this, right? Teachers are the experts in their classrooms. They know their students. They know their families. They know their needs. But we need to know enough that we can talk about it and have good conversations and make good decisions. 
So Ohio has developed a coaching framework, you'll see this within the plan, where we have identified there's this instructional coaching component, and then there's a systems coaching component. And what does it look like? Instructional coaching is coaching that instruction based on the data, what the data is telling you. What are the strategies that you're using? That's probably what we're most familiar with, right? Systems coaching is developing knowledge and skills and abilities of the infrastructures, the systems, to be able to help support those teachers. So again, we're really good at, at figuring out and, and coming up with professional development for teachers, right? Even, uh, even the vendors are good at doing that, right? Our universities are good at doing that. The studies, when you read studies, who's the professional development for? Teachers, right? But how are we supporting the system so that they can support the teachers? And I think this is one of our key pieces. All right, family partnerships, families engaging with schools, and families engaging with literacy at home. What does that look like? So how are the schools engaging families? How are teachers engaging families with what their children are learning in school? And then how are the families then using that information to engage their children in literacy at home? And what does that look like? Again, I need your brains and I need your research and anything that you know about this to help support. Community collaborations. Um, Superintendent D. Maria likes to talk about these networks and building networks, and that collectively we're more powerful as a group than, than individuals. So think about um, what are the community collaborations that you have? Networks to share successes, problems and practices, the root cause analyses, how can we figure out what is it that's causing this? Why, when Tim says, as a, as a nation, we're flatlined since the 70s, the 70s. That was astonishing to me, right? And then community-wide systems of support. So we talk about our building, our district systems of support. Do we have community-wide systems of support? And what do those look like? Section four, Ohio's literacy vision. Here it is. All right, so our literacy vision for all our learners is to acquire the knowledge and skills to read at grade level. The Ohio Department of Education and its partners will utilize literacy acquisition and achievement as the lever for school improvement. The department promotes the implementation of evidence-based systems and instructional practices to increase learners' achievement across all content areas and age levels. Here's that image that I was telling you about, an educational cascade. So this one is missing families and communities down here at this end. But when we think about the support and the infrastructure that we need to have to support, so this is where our teachers are. And we are supporting the educational practices heavily on this end, right? We need to support the supporting infrastructures as we get to these other ends. And so that's why you see the balance happen here, right? So the state level, regional level, maybe not so much the educational practices because they're not working directly with students, but we need to be knowledgeable about what these are. But we need to be provided support on how do we, how do we support that? How do we build that across the state? Our vision commitments, all right, simple view of reading. Simple view of reading is thinking about the kids that I shared earlier, the adult that, that I shared earlier. It is you're decoding your word recognition multiplied by language comprehension to equal reading proficiency. So the examples I gave of my own kids, if you have a deficit in one, you don't get that reading proficiency. The multiplication <laughs> sign is key. So when you are a critical user of your curriculum or critical user of professional development, is what you're receiving or what you have in front of you addressing both sides of that equation? Is it heavily, heavily supporting one side of the equation? If it is, then let's be critical users and say, I need to go find some other things to support this side of the equation or this side of the equation. That's what tends to happen. If there was a perfect curriculum, like Tim said this morning, we'd all have it and our numbers would be like this. There isn't. They will say that the Right, they're selling, I, this is a perfect, everybody buy this, it's perfect, it has all this, it's evidence-based, they'll put all the words in there, but we need to be those critical users. So th remember the simple view of reading. We also include in here the language and literacy development, a continuum, a continuum that goes from emergent literacy up to disciplinary literacy. We have general and special education partnerships, so how are we doing that? Within our early literacy pilot, what we have found is when our classroom teachers are heavily collaborating with the special education teachers, they're learning. Both, both groups of teachers are learning. The special education teachers are learning what the general education teachers, what their expertise is, 
and the general education teachers are learning all the expertise that the special education teachers are doing. What I've heard in some of our districts is that more of our special ed teachers are pushing in and the teachers love it because they say, I've never seen somebody model that before. I've never seen somebody give an example of that before. Because when they're pulling them out, we don't get to, uh, gen ed teachers don't get to see what are, these, what are these specific skills and how do they work on them with certain students. And then the infrastructure supports. Okay, this is Dr. Laura Justice. She's at The Ohio State University. So a common way to think about reading is that it is the product of decoding and language comprehension. So decoding is one's ability to apply the alphabetic principle to crack the code that hides uh, words behind letters and sounds. Um, on the other hand, language comprehension is your vocabulary skill, your grammar skill, your ability to comprehend uh, complex narratives as they unfold over time. And so we view reading as the product of both of those things, one's ability to crack the code or decode and one's ability to comprehend um, language. So if we view reading as the product of decoding and language comprehension, you could uh, think of a circumstance in which a child has weak skills in each or one, either one of those dimensions. For instance, a child could be a weak decoder. And if you're a weak decoder, um, and yet you have good language comprehension, if reading is the product of decoding and language comprehension, the child would still be a poor reader. Uh, and the converse is also true. If you have um, a child who has very good decoding skills, but very poor language comprehension, um, based on the simple view of reading, we would view them as not being a good reader. So if we view a skilled reader as having skills in both decoding and language comprehension, what we want to do is backtrack into the preschool years and think about how we can build those skills that are forerunners or precursors to future decoding and language comprehension success. Um, so uh, skills like print knowledge, phonological awareness, vocabulary, those are considered precursory skills to future decoding and language comprehension ability. All right, so here's our simple view of reading equation. Decoding word level reading, the ability to transform print into spoken language. You automatically do this, right? You don't have to stop and decode this word. You don't, you don't, you're not, when you see this slide, it's automatic. That's what we want, automaticity for our students, for our learning, right? You don't go de, ek, uh, de. You don't do that. You automatically put those together. Language comprehension, the ability to understand spoken language. What I'm saying today, some of it you might be listening to, some of you you might be tuning out, but what is your language comprehension? And, and multiplied together, we have the reading comprehension. So the simple view of reading, here's what we want everyone to do. Understand the reading process. If I teach math, I better understand that mm, what's quotient. Can my students read the word quotient? Do they understand what that means? Do they know how to recognize what it means when it's in a story problem? You see how literacy now is embedded within a math content area. Selection of core reading programs and any needed supplements. So what is that? And, the, and we, I just talked about that. Are we de, are there uh, a, a deficit in one side of the equation? Assessments of reading challenges. Are we using the right assessments? And I know assessments is a bad word. But are we using the right ones? Are they telling us the right things? And then selection of practices and interventions. Are the practices and interventions that I am selecting map onto what my data says I need? for a grade level. It might not be all grade levels. It might look different. In fact, it probably will look different at grade levels. All right, language and literacy continuum. So we think about emergent literacy and Dr. Justice to talk about those emergent literacy skills. What did she say? Print knowledge, phonological awareness, and what was the third one? Vocabulary, right? So think about my story that Jathan shared with me about the, the adult that was in the DMV. And when they said, this is your temporary license, didn't understand what the word temporary meant. Emergent literacy, how is our vocabulary building? Moving into early literacy, right? So that builds on those skills. Into conventional literacy, you guys are all in conventional literacy. You can pick up almost anything and read it. You might have trouble with some words or not understand, you know, what does that mean in that sentence or context. Sometimes when I read research articles, I do a lot of circling of words and I keep my list of words I need to look up because I'm not quite sure what that word means there. 
and then into our adolescent literacy. So what we need to think about is what is the support for all learners across the literacy development continuum? So when you're putting together your local literacy team to write your plan, do you have an early childhood person represented on your team, even if you're K-12, even if you're middle school? If you're K-12 middle school, if you're early childhood, do you have a K-5 person on your team? Because that's where these little people are going to go. And it's, they're going to move through this continuum. And if they're stuck in emergent literacy and a teacher's automatically just going to start teaching or emergent early literacy skills or conventional, you've got your kids. These are your start behind, stay behind kids. All right, we have our presumed competency, competence. So all learners, no matter the complexity of their disability, have the potential to grow their skills and knowledge in language and literacy. We believe that, right? We know that. There, there are, there's research out there that said that all of our learners can learn. Emergent literacy, there's our phonological processing, our print awareness, and our oral language. So if you're looking at your assessments and you can get to the subscales, get to those sub subscales. In your data analysis section, don't just give me, and I'm going to be reading these, your data dump. What is your data telling you? Don't give me data I already know that I can pull from the state. I know how many of your third graders are proficient. I can look that up. But I can't look up your subscales to see, is it second grade is low in this and third grade is low in that? This is uh, Dr. Susan Landry. So uh, both of these people were on the panels for uh, what Tim was showing you early, earlier, the NELP reports. A professor of Pediatrics at the Children's Learning Institute, the University of Texas Houston Health Science Center, and the director of the institute, and a program called CIRCLE, uh, the Center for Improving the Readiness of Children for Learning and Education. Phonological awareness is all auditory. That means children are listening, hearing sounds, and then trying to play with manipulating those sounds. Uh, for example, rhyming a cat, bat, hat. That would be a beginning area of phonological awareness for a young child to be exposed to. Uh, it's different from phonics in that uh, it's not linked to the written word um, so that a child is really just be learning at this point to hear and pay attention to sounds and be able to manipulate those sounds themselves. The term phonological awareness is very descriptive of what's going on. They are, or young children are, becoming very aware of sounds. And we take that for granted. Um, phonological awareness for most adults is sort of second nature. You, you hear sounds, you can um, make the first sound of a word, but for a young child, listening for the first sound of a word and separating it from the second part of the word, like sidewalk or side, uh, and putting those back together, that's a very new um, thing for them, a new activity to get involved in. We're learning that phonological awareness is one of the, one of the most critical uh, things a child needs to be exposed to, along with language uh, building activities and print knowledge or print awareness activities to prepare them to be successful to learn to read. And, and it's important because they are beginning to uh, sensitize themselves, learn to hear those sounds. And reading is about making sense of written words on the page and, and being able to translate a written word into sound. So this is that beginning piece where the child uh, starts to pay attention uh, to the fact that there are different sounds, that words are made up of different sounds before they get to that symbolic stage of seeing printed words and having to, to put that together with the sounds of the printed words. We are learning from uh, an analysis. OK. So when you think about, did you, did you know this? So here's your vocabulary learning for the day. There's phonological awareness, there's phon phonemic awareness, and there's phonics. <coughs> Do you know the difference between those? 
I see some mm, and some mm, I don't, I'm not quite sure. We tend to, and I've even seen it written in research articles, interchange those. They are completely different things. And these are the things that our young learners and some of our middle school learners and our high school learners and the 53-year-old learner that I got the call about doesn't know how to do. So can they manipulate those sounds? Minus print, right? So I say cat, you say cat. Say cat. Now instead of k, say b. Now instead of, okay, say bat. Now instead of bats, instead of t, say k. Back. Now you've manipulated the ending sound, right? <clears throat> say back. Now instead of ass, say uh. Buck. Where does the buck stop? <laughs> the buck stops here, right? Phonological processing, can you do that? There are activities you can do with middle school and high school kids that are more advanced language where they're manipulating uh, morphemes, uh, you know, units, smallest units of meaning in words, where you're taking off a prefix or a suffix. Can you do that? If you can do that, and then you see it in print, it's easier for you to decode, to crack that code in order to do that. These are what some of our, our struggling readers, as they get older, don't know how to do. And for us to slow down and do it, it's trickier, isn't it? Because we, we automatically do that. Beginning sounds easy to, easiest to manipulate, ending sound a little bit harder, middle sound and vowel sounds even harder. Vowel sounds, one of my reading teachers in here, the hardest things, long vowel, short vowel. So when you're looking at your curriculum, when you're being those critical users, critical consumers, are you seeing these things in there? Or is it missing? Does your curriculum assume that all kids coming to you already know how to do this? Because I guarantee you, all kids do not know how to do these things. All right, early literacy. So emergent literacy leads to early literacy. Here are some things, and Tim talked about Hattie's work a little bit, medium to large predictive relationships, right? If our kids can know these things, then they have a higher percentage later of, of being successful readers. Alphabet knowledge, so now we bring in the print. Does phonological awareness bring in letters? Everybody go like this. No, it does not. It's about sounds. Phonological awareness, rapid automatic naming. Okay, you might see RAN, R-A-N, in some of your assessments. Writing or name writing and phonological memory. So that's also storing. Can you remember all of these things in a sequence of these sounds? Also thinking about moderately correlated with at least one measure of later literacy achievement are those concepts of print, print knowledge, reading readiness, oral language, and visual processing, right? I know that our early childhood folks pay special attention to that oral language, right? How, what kind of words are our young children using? Uh, the, uh, us working with older kids, we need to think about that too. What is the language that's being used? Um, I was in a meeting yesterday and somebody said, I'm waiting for something to get approved, and they use the word squishy. It's still squishy, I think is what they said. And I said, squishy? And my literacy nerd in me said, well, that's a tier one word. Squishy is kind of a common word that we all know. When I say squishy, you guys all understand that, right? But what does that mean? So what is our vocabulary? Are we using all tier one common words, or do we have some more sophisticated language? Because as we move through and texts get harder and kids get bigger and they're sitting in bigger classrooms, right, the language we know that they're reading is more complex. It's going to have tier two words. When they get into their content areas, they're going to have science words. They're going to have math words. They're going to have what, historical terms. Do they know how to decode those words? Do they know how to crack the code once they get out of the basic reading environment? All right, conventional literacy then, so now we're leading into the conventional literacy. This is where we have the five components of reading. When you're critically looking at what you're doing, are you, are you addressing all of those components? Are you heavy in one? Are you, not, are you weak in another? Are you heavy in the right one? Is what your data telling you what you're focusing on? So when you think about these conventional literacies, even though I teach third grade, I can't just assume they all come knowing how to do these things, right? Even though I teach seventh grade math, I can't I assume that they all can understand and decode the words that are going to be put in front of them. All right, there they are. Phonics, fluency, vocabulary, comprehension. And fluency, this is, this is also a tricky one. Um, I was at a funeral this week where a group was reading things um, you know, out of a book, and I, I kept thinking, wow, their fluency just isn't, isn't spot on. But when you think about that too, when they're, when they're reading, if, it's, if they're not reading it every day, if it's not words they're reading every day, these were kind of like scripture reading. So again, the vocabulary, how do we build that fluency? And these were adult learners. 
Conventional literacy, there are your skills on this side. Now we think about the changing emphasis across grade levels. This is also included in our plan. This section is heavy because what we found is that we, we, tend to, we tend to come up with policy, right, and all these other things, but we don't give you the content. This plan is heavy on the content in this section. And so I, I really encourage you to read this section and don't just hand it to your literacy specialist to read. Leaders need to read this section to understand it so that when you're walking through classrooms and you're talking with your district folks, when you're talking to parents, you understand these things. So in a perfect world, the highlighted is what would be taught in these grade levels, right? Hit hard in these grade levels. Blending and segmenting for phonemic awareness. And phonemic awareness is manipulating those smallest units of sound like we just did with CAT. Moving into in a perfect world, the middle of first grade, everybody would master that and we'd be good, we'd move on. Does that happen in reality? Not so much, right? So we still need to continue that all the way through fifth grade. We should still be teaching phonemic awareness in fifth grade. Addition, deletion, substitute, spelling, dictation. This is where we get into those morphemes, those prefixes, the suffixes, Latin roots. Am I scaring you guys? You have flashbacks from when you were younger? I didn't like learning that stuff. It kind of freaked me out. But how are we getting there? Phonics moving across, sound basic phonics. So phonics is now connecting the sound to the language. We'll see that heavy in your curriculum in kindergarten and first grade. But guess what? Not everybody masters it by the middle of first grade. So what are we doing to improve that? Fluency, vocabulary, comprehension. So you see, once we get into fourth and fifth grade, when you're looking at your curriculum and strategies, it's going to be heavy here. But we know we still have students that need some of these other pieces here. Speaking and listening. OK, adolescent literacy. Here we go. Across content areas. Are we thinking about literacy across the content areas, and how are we addressing that? What happens when my, when my daughter goes from fourth grade to fifth grade, or fifth grade to sixth grade, or eighth grade to high school? Who is helping to develop her literacy across those content areas? Disciplinary literacy, moving again into the different disciplines, and then intensive interventions. What do those look like in our adolescents? Right? So strategies across the content areas would include explicit vocabulary instruction. Think about your classrooms. Think about your middle school classrooms. As a parent, the first thing I do when I walk into the middle school and I do the open house at the beginning of the year, when I walk into every classroom, I look to see, is there some type of vocabulary wall in this classroom, whether it's math, science, social studies? What terms does my daughter need to know that this teacher, this, this class, is teaching her so that when she is tested, right, for comprehension, does she know this? She can automatically know those words so that she can make those decisions to answer those comprehension questions. Comprehension strategy instructions. What comprehension strategies are they teaching? Right? Do they know? Can they articulate that? Can you articulate? If a parent calls you and says, why did my child do so bad on this state test in comprehension, do you know how to answer that? Or do we blame the test? Academic language support, right? How are we building that academic language? How are we building it in speaking, in listening, in reading, and in writing across content areas for adolescents? Do we hear our adolescents using some of these words once they leave that classroom or the test is over? This is Dorothy Shanahan. In order for somebody to read, really read in a particular discipline like history or science or any of the sciences are actually a little different or literature you have to you should really know something about the discipline itself because every discipline has certain expectations they have different ways of creating knowledge each discipline has a different way of sharing that knowledge with each other and each discipline has a different way of evaluating that knowledge so historians base their stories that they create on documents on, as evidence. Those documents were created in the past, so they can't do experiments. Scientists do experiments, and they have particular kinds of questions they're asking about the world that are different than the kinds of questions that historians are asking about the world. Um, those who study literature are, in, a totally different realm. So they have different ideas about what they expect in terms of a good 
historical narrative, a good science experiment, uh, a good analysis of a, of a piece of literature. They have different expectations because they started out with different questions. Um, so these disciplines are really different. And if you know a little bit about what the expectations are in the discipline, that can guide your reading. It can provide you with an approach to reading that will give you a more critical, um, deep knowledge about what you're reading. So disciplinary literacy is those liter the, the literacy that you would use in studying a particular discipline. All right, so think about that. Think about your, your middle school, high schoolers. How much time is in between each class? How many minutes do they have to get from one place to the other? Three, right? Think about our kindergarten through fifth graders. How many minutes do they have to switch from, oh, reading's over, it's time for math? Their brains have to do different things, right? They have to get into a different frame of reference every time they switch the environment. When you guys go home from your work environment, when you go from your home environment to your work environment, we have, how many people have more than a two minute drive? Okay, so we have a drive where we can like, okay, I gotta switch from this mode to this mode. But our learners, we're asking them to do it like this. And what if they're still thinking about what I just learned in science, but now I'm in social studies or math? Where's your comprehension? So how are we, how are we thinking about that when we're thinking about our disciplinary literacies? All right, then uh, we talk about struggling readers and what does that look like? So part of disadvantaged students under this grant, the definition is students with disabilities, students living in poverty. So your percentage of students, how many percentage of students are you serving? So we're gonna ask you to tell us this. How many are students living in poverty? How many students with disabilities? How many English learners? And how many students who are having reading difficulty. Well, how are you going to figure that out? Right? Using your assessments, using your probably, I predict, your not on track, on track data to say that I have a high percentage of X students in X grade. And when we read that, and when leaders, my leaders in the room, my curriculum directors, my principals, when you see that, your first question should say, if that percentage is that high at second grade or eighth grade, then we must not be teaching that skill very well. And it could be that our teachers don't have the resources to teach that skill that well. So that again goes back to the educational cascade. Are we all looking at it and thinking about things in, in the right ways and how we can all support it? Not just how the teacher's gonna do it in third grade, right, the magic grade where, did you see that too in the data? Did you notice third grade was higher than all the other grades and after third grade it went down? That makes me sad. All right, struggling readers. So we have nearly 30% of Ohio's K-3 students are reading below grade level. Nearly 40% of students in three through eight are not proficient on our, on our English language arts assessments. And more than 50% of graduating seniors taking the ACT do not meet the college and career readiness benchmark for reading. I see it in the courses I teach at university, right? I see it in their writing. I don't see it in their reading because I don't necessarily see them read. I hear it in the vocabulary that they use. And, I, and these, are your, these are your future teachers. These are our future teachers. So how are, we supporting, how are we supporting them so that they can be better citizens, as Tim talked about this morning? When we get into that root cause analysis, again, we're thinking about students who start behind, stay behind, and we talk about that. Some districts were either not utilizing effective excuse me, instructional practices or not implementing them with fidelity. Are we looking at that? Are we looking at adult implementation? And then when we think about the different types of readers and the difficulties that they have, okay, many of you probably fall here. Typical reader, which means I have strong word reading and I have strong language comprehension. There's that simple view. If I have a phonological difficulty, that means I'm weak in word reading, right? But I could be strong in comprehension. If I have language difficulties, my comprehension isn't good, right? Then I'm, I might be good in phonological awareness, but not so good here. This is where most of our reading problems actually lie right here. There's a mix of those. 
And there's a mix because when we think about it, don't they go hand in hand? Right? If you can't decode words or you're taking too long in decoding words because you're not automatic, so I have, a, I have a phonological deficit, I'm losing comprehension time. Have you guys ever seen the eye tracking videos? Has anybody ever seen those? Where they put the eye tracking on, on struggling readers, a, a, a good reader and a struggling reader. A good reader, you'll see a ball and it bounces from word to word and it goes like this. And every once in a while it goes back because, you know, when you got, we, I do it. When I read it, I go, what, what did that say? Or I didn't read that right, so I'll go back. A struggling reader, when you watch this, the ball goes very slow, and the longer the eye fixates on one word, they're trying to decode it, the ball gets bigger. And you watch this, and it's so painful to watch because you see how hard these kids are working, to try to, or adults, to try to, to decode, to try to crack the code to understand. And what we, and think about that, our middle school, high school, and even elementary, we're, we're, we're go, 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 go all the time because we have to get to the next thing. So some of our kids are struggling so hard that they can't get past that. Right? Those are our kids with these mixed reading difficulties. And essentially, 80% of our kids who are diagnosed with dyslexia have a phonological processing deficit. So phonological processing is the sounds. So is, if you have a high percentage of, of students identified as, as being dyslexic, do you have the resources in place? Do you have knowledgeable teachers in place that know how to support that? All of our teachers should know. I tell you what, if you have an SLP, how many have a speech and language pathologist on your, on your crew? Tap into them. They know this. They know, they know that. Use them. So use your experts in your buildings. Two, when you think about your professional development plans, absolutely do that. Uh, general and special education partnerships, I talked a little bit about this earlier too. Integrated comprehensive systems framework. So focus on equity and best practices. So just because I have an inclusion classroom, right, and I taught an inclusion, four or five inclusion split classroom in Chicago public schools. Here's how they convinced me to do that. My principal said, we're going to give you a full-time special ed teacher to be in there with you. I was like, that's great. I get two teachers in one room. And then they introduced me to my special ed teacher who was a brand new teacher, just graduated from college, from a small town in Ohio, moving into Chicago public schools. And I thought, oh, gosh. How am I, now I need to collaborate, right? Because she's coming from a different completely culture, working in a small rural town into Chicago public schools, four or five split inclusion classroom. So how are we doing that? Just because she, they're in the room, just because there's an aide sitting next to our special education students in classrooms, doesn't mean they have equal opportunity or equitable, equitable access to what is being learned in that classroom, right? Physically filling the space doesn't necessarily do that. So how are we going to establish equitable structures, locations, and arrangement of students and staff? Implement change by leveraging funding and regulations in support of proactive service delivery and establish access to high quality teaching and learning for all learners through developing teacher capacity. So in that classroom, did I learn from my special ed teacher? I absolutely did because I did not have the content knowledge that she had. Did she learn from me about how to work with inner city Chicago kids that are fourth and fifth grade? Yes, she did because I had that expertise and the language and literacy expertise that I have. But we learned from each other. And as the years went on, it, it got better. I was a little afraid in the beginning. All right, infrastructures that support. We're thinking about state, regional, and local. So what is the networking to support improvement efforts? You being here today is part of that networking. You can find my email anywhere, part of that networking. All right, so how are we doing that? The state level, regional, local. What we're trying to do at the state is, it's not just about compliance, right? It's not just, did you do this? Did you fill out this form? Did you complete all of the sections? But what does the quality look like? And how are we monitoring that quality? And how are we making sure that it is sustainable? And how are we working across networks? And these are all of the resources that we have um, to help support but these resources look like this compared to the work that we have to do that looks like this. Thank you, all of you, for sitting in here.